Good morning, church. Welcome to New York City Church of Christ, the Bronx region. My name is Dexter Mowat, and my beautiful wife here, Cheryl Mowat. Good morning. We have a privilege to share the, the, the scripture with you in Acts 242. Can you read that for me, please? They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. God has blessed us with, with so many things that where we can communicate uh, with each other and to praise God and to worship him in spirit and truth. So as a Christian, we have to devote ourselves to, to the teaching, to reading our Bible, to, to praying, to encourage each other daily. And not just to read alone, but to apply the scripture to our lives as well. So uh, let us pray. Father God, we thank you, God, for give us this privilege, Father, to worship you and to praise you, God, especially in these challenged times, dear God. We thank you for giving us the comfort that we need, the strength to carry on through these times. We pray, God, that we will be devoted to you and to one another through scripture reading and through prayer. Father, we pray you be with the rest of the service. Be with me with Maurice as he preach. I pray everyone will enjoy the service. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Couldn't find 
There's nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nobody greater. There's nobody greater. Nobody Church. I'm Scott Williams. I've been asked to do the communion message this morning, and I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8, two verses, verse 35, and then we're going to jump down to 38. So as it reads, Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And then 38, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I have to admit that in my lifetime, uh, in the church, these 30 years, um, there are two areas where I really felt like I was separated from God. Uh, one of them was trouble, sin in my life. Um, and obviously that often makes us all feel separated from God. Um, the other was death, the death of my son, the death of my two brothers last year. And even during this time, COVID, there's been a lot of death. So my question is, how can we make ourselves and others not feel like we're separated from God? I, not, I know it's not always easy, especially with my personality. I know, I, you know, sometimes I often get into disagreements and, you know, after some emotional wrestling as I, I I'll have to go back, I have to revisit this and I got to talk, I got to work it out, I got to resolve this. And, you know, it becomes, you know, it's a reminder that, you know, obviously we all know that we're nobody's perfect, but, um, you know, in the church we want to have, be a positive influence. So uh, I just want to share that. I just, you know, to think about that. And we're going to pray right now. Heavenly Father God, great God in heaven, make of heaven and earth and everything and everyone. I just want to thank you so much, Lord, for uh, never 
separating us from your love, God. We, we appreciate that so much. We pray that you can continue to guide us, strengthen us, comfort us, uh, give us direction according to your will, according to your word, according to your way. We pray all those things in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus gathered the twelve disciples to share the Passover meal once more, remember.
stingy planner gets a stingy crop. A lavish planner gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and to make your own mind up what you will give. That you will protect will protect you from sob stories and arm wrestling. God loves it when the giver delights in giving. God can pour on blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything. More than just ready to do what needs to be done. Good morning. My name is Cedric Hawkins. Uh, I will be doing the communion message for us today. I want us to take time to look um, at the heart of giving today. And I know physically we know that we need to give financial contributions. But even with our financial contributions, are we just giving or are we being a cheerful giver? I have been reading this book. It's called 10 Minutes to Knowing Men and Women in the Bible. It's been good. It's been a good spark for me in my daily uh, learning different characteristics, traits that I want to work on in my character. You know, during COVID, I got an opportunity to stop, to slow down, to take some time for myself to learn, to grow in areas uh, that I was just needing just to address them. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about my heart towards God, giving, serving to God, and serving to others. The Bible teaches uh, in James chapter 1, 22 to 25, says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not does what it says is someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at his face goes away immediately forgetting what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues not forgetting what he has heard but doing it will be blessed in what he does. I came to a period of time in my life where I got weary and serving others you might ask well how why I saw that people um, weren't grateful for the things that I was doing for them my motives were totally wrong um, but but my spirit kept fighting me kept fighting me when I didn't want to serve I had to go and serve because that's what was in my heart to go serve uh, instead um, you know I did it reluctantly I you know, I've always had a love and a respect for God's word. Uh, but you know what? I was having a, a, a spiritual temper tantrum, you know? Um, hopefully you guys can relate to that, right? Uh, but I couldn't let my emotions get the best of me. Uh, I need to be obedient. I needed to be obedient to God's word. Now here's the kicker. I thought people wouldn't notice that I was just doing what I do. But people know that when I serve, I, I try to serve all out. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. So you know exactly how I'm feeling, what's going on with me. You know, it wasn't hard to see that I wasn't happy in the areas of serving. God noticed me and um, he noticed that I wasn't doing my best for him. So here's some of the things that I learned during my time studying out. Service to God doesn't require public notice. So my question to you is, what are your motives in your service to God? You know. Uh, if your motive or anything other than to bring glory to God, then they're misdirected. Seek and serve God and his people without demanding a public applause. Remember that you're doing it for God, and that should be reward enough. Number two, a righteous person requires a righteous response. Isaiah had to realize, right, that in order for him to be served by God, in, in order for him to be used by God, that he had to be purified. That he had to get rid of what was going on in his heart, right? In his mind, he had to get rid of those things. For me, I use crying out. I cried out to God, uh, yelling respectfully, but my emotions were raw and honest. And thirdly, God's message must be faithfully communicated in spite of the response. God is asking you to faithfully communicate the message of Jesus Christ and patiently leave the response in his hands. How is your heart towards giving to God and his people? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you again for today. Thanks for your love and your patience. I pray that you be with today's contribution that's collected uh, church-wide, especially here in the Bronx. Uh, help it to go to those in need. Help it go to our church function as we get back to opening up uh, in person soon. God, thank you so much for your love, God. Thank you so much for being patient with me as I work on being um, generous towards you and giving to your, your, your church family. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray.
Amen. I'm singing all night. All day. Jesus is watching over me. I'm singing all night. Welcome to the Sunday worship service of the Bronx region of the New York City Church of Christ. We're glad you're able to join us here today, and hopefully you will be inspired, challenged, and encouraged by today's time. You know, as 2021 comes to a close, and we're probably like, yes, I'm so glad this year is almost over. But in reality, we still have a few more months left. So what we want to focus on for the rest of this year is finishing strong. That's what we want to do, finishing strong. You know, it's pretty simple to start something, but it's a whole nother thing to end it, to accomplish it, to complete the work. You know, even in the Bronx, we have several marathon runners. You know, Ralph runs a marathon, Patricia, Dahima, we have some marathon runners. And they will tell you that it's one thing to start a race, but it's a whole completely different thing 
to finish a marathon. Because to finish something, you have to pay a price. It's a challenge. It's, it's, it's something that brings out endurance, patience, perseverance. It takes more than just, oh, I'm out here. You have to really push yourself. You know, and some people think, don't start something if you can't finish it. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to think. Why start something if I'm not going to finish it? Then he can get you to not do nothing. You will just sit down and watch everybody else and you yourself do nothing. That's Satan's mind game. If you can't finish it, don't start it. If I can't finish the spiritual journey, don't ever become a Christian. If I can't fit, I mean, that's what Satan wants each of us to feel like. But God tells us again, take captive those thoughts. We will start certain things and it may be a challenge, but we still can get the job done. So today, that's what I want to do. I want to help us focus, help us be inspired to finish the work. Not just get it done, but get it done the right way. You know, God has given each of us a task, a focus. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, let's turn there, Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, the Christian life, the Christian race, as the author puts it here, he paints a picture and it's a picture of a marathon. It's not a jog, it's not even a sprint, but it's a marathon. The author calls us to endure and to persevere. You know, this reminds me of uh, in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, when Jesus was talking to this guy who said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, boxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. In other words, Jesus is saying, you need to realize if you're going to follow me, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be challenges. I'm not going to know where I'm going to sleep at tonight. I may not even know where my next meal is going to come from. So if you really want to follow me, you have to understand this is what it's all about. You know, at the start of a race, it's almost like a party. I mean, there's so many people, there's crowds, people taking pictures, you know, they're excited. It's just a, a blast at the beginning of a race. But then as the marathon goes, there are, there are people that break away from the pack. They start to float out in the distance further and further. You may not even be able to see them after a while. And then you look around and there's not all the crowds on the side anymore. There are a few people scattered here and there, but nobody's cheering your name unless it's your family or a close friend, but they're not there the whole way. It may be sporadic here and there. So then you start to feel lonely. Then you start, you start to feel like, what, what is going on here? That's how our spiritual journey can be also. When you're getting baptized, people screaming, standing up, clapping, and giving you flowers, taking you to lunch calling you every day, praying with you, all that's going on. But then as time goes on, those calls stop coming as frequent. You got to cook your own ramen noodles instead of getting taken out for lunch. There's things that happen that may make you feel isolated, lonely, discouraged. See, this is what happens in our spiritual journey. There are going to be difficulties that come our way. You know, I myself personally, I, I'm, I don't run marathons. I don't like. Once I finished playing football, I thought, I am not running unless I'm playing a sport or a bear is chasing me. Other than that, I'm not running from nothing. You can forget it. That's just me personally. But in our spiritual journey, it isn't a sprint. It's not a jog. It's a marathon. And a marathon runner will tell you quickly, there's two critical times in a race. The first one, is at the beginning because at the beginning you're excited you're you're all juiced up you got all this energy and you can just go out there and you're thinking i'm just gonna go out there and make this happen and you can expend so much energy at the beginning that there's nothing left for the middle or the end the beginning of the race is very important 
Another crucial point is the halfway point. Because you're running and you're going and you're like, okay, it, you kind of hit a place and it's like, oh, I'm getting a little bit tired here. And then you think, and this is where the mental aspect come in. Then you think, if I'm tired now, I still got another half to run. Oh my goodness. See, running a marathon isn't just physical, it's a mental game as well. You're thinking, I've come halfway and I'm this tired. Imagine what it's going to be like the other half. And see, even in our spiritual journey, it's not just a spiritual thing. It's a mental thing. Satan comes after you mentally. He wants to discourage you mentally. See, if you're running uh, 15 miles and you got to the seven and a half mile mark and you're thinking another seven and a half miles, that's all that's going to be playing in your mind. Another seven and a half, another seven and a half. You're going to get so discouraged. You're going to be like, I'm not running this other seven and a half. I'm done. And that's what Satan wants. He wants you to think, I've come this far. I, I, I've done all this and I got to continue to do this. He wants to get you so discouraged mentally, emotionally, that you give up. In a marathon, that's called hitting the wall, where you run to the point that, bam, it's like, oh, and that's the make or break point. Spiritually, you can hit a wall. You can run, bam, and it's like, okay, where do I go from here? What's going on? It doesn't necessarily have to be a sin that makes you hit the wall. It could be life. It could be health, finances. It's so many options. But each of us will hit the wall spiritually. And that's the point that determines whether or not you continue in a marathon or you give up running. I want us to focus today on how do we finish strong. Point number one, be prepared for the struggles to come. The first thing we got to do, we got to be prepared for the struggles to come. You say, well, what are the struggles? How, how in the world do we know there's going to be a virus? No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. Things are going to happen that we don't know or foresee. But if we're close to God, we can still endure, persevere, and continue on. But there's many people that have stopped running. Now, I'm referring to Christians who have lost their energy, their enthusiasm to fight against the flesh, to fight against the dark forces that are out there. See, again, we know this, but we often forget our enemy is not each other. Your enemy is not the church, is not the elders, not the evangelist, not your Bible talk leader, your roommate, or your spot. It, no, that, that's not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. But we can get so exhausted that we start to see other enemies out there that aren't really the enemies. It's Satan that is the enemy. So we got people that may come to church. They may even give their contribution. They may even watch it on YouTube or Zoom, but then all of a sudden, their heart is not at the same place. Instead of still running the race, they're on the sideline. And still, instead of keep chugging along that spiritual journey, they're starting to hit a wall and they're starting to contemplate, do I keep going? Do I not keep going? See, many today are not prepared mentally, emotionally, spiritually for a marathon. They're prepared for a jog or even a sprint, but it's a whole different thing to prepare yourself mentally and emotionally as well as spiritually for a marathon. Why? Because we may expect certain things like, okay, now I'm a Christian. I don't expect to have all those challenges I used to have before I was a Christian. Mm, they're still going to come your way. Good thing you have God on your side, but those challenges are still going to come your way. You may be thinking, well, I've been doing this so long and God still hasn't given me the desires of my heart. He said, if I, if I go to him, if I love him, he'll give me the desires of my heart. Maybe God is saying you still need to wait, be patient and grow in some areas. Just because we don't get the desires of a heart does not mean we stop running the race. Maybe you're thinking, I don't get all the attention I used to get. You know, why, why am I not getting that focus? You know what? Again, our enemy is Satan, not anybody else. So we have to make sure we're continuing to run the race, even though challenges come our way. Why do you say that? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. 
Jesus had challenges. Jesus had obstacles to overcome. And he was the only one that never sinned. See, we're unprepared for the hard knocks of life if we're not focused on let God's will be done. See, when we're focused on us, how we feel, what's going on with me, instead of, is this God's will? Let me try to see, find, understand God's will in this situation. That'll help you get through it. But if it's about us, our feelings, our emotions, what's happening to me, that's, that will make you stop the marathon. See, we got to make sure we are being what Jesus wants us to be. You know what? Jesus' best work was in the last stages of his journey. You think about it. You say, no, wasn't it feeding the 5,000? No, wasn't it raising people from the dead? That wasn't his best work. His best work was in his last days on the cross. At the end of this marathon, he had a lot to do. Let's go back again. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The Bible says we need to think about Jesus and how he was on the cross, how he uh, had dealt with the opposition from the sinful men. We need to look at that and see how he persevered through that and why he persevered through that for us. Why should we focus on that? Why should we look to Jesus? Why should we look to that cross? That way we will not grow weary and lose heart. If we stop focusing on Jesus, if we stop trying to build a relationship with Jesus, we're going to get tired. We're going to get weary. We're going to get exhausted. And then we're going to lose heart. How do you not lose heart? Just what it says here in verse 2. Fix our eyes on Jesus. See, are you tired? Are you discouraged? Have you quit running? Are you standing on the sidelines maybe? Why? I don't know. Life is hard. You're going to get hit with challenges. But how do you overcome them? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't fix it on Fox News, CNN, Facebook, TikTok, don't worry about those things. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing that will help us finish strong in 2021 is this. We need to forget what is behind us. We need to forget what is behind us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. It says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know, I watch some people run. Uh, I watch them. I don't run. But I watch some people run. I do go to the gym and work out on the treadmill. So I don't run. But anyway, another story. Some people run. They're like a gazelle. Smooth, fluent. I mean, it, it, it's just nice. And then some people run and it's like, boom, 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 boom. It's like, oh my goodness. Is it the Jolly Green Giant coming down the street? People run at different places. People run in different ways, but we're all in a race. We're all in a spiritual race here. Philippians 3.12. Again, he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You know, that's encouraging to me. Paul is in a race 
And he says, listen, I can't finish this race without Jesus. I'm going to press on. But the thing I understand is that Christ Jesus took hold of me. The only way I'm going to get through this is with Jesus. See, Paul's goal was to do Christ's will. It was to have the same goal as Christ. He knew that Christ had to supply him the resources, the strength to make his finish happen. He said, I do not consider myself there yet, but I'm giving a hundred percent to get there. He said, I'm not there. This is the apostle Paul telling us he's not there. I'm not there, but I'm giving it a hundred percent. So the question is, how much are we really giving right now in our spiritual journey? How much are you really giving? He says, this one thing I do, forget what is behind. And this is important because sometimes we can't give 100% until we forget certain things that's happened in the past. You know, I played many football games, high school, college, else, you know, continuing on. But I've fumbled the ball multiple times. And after fumbling and the other team gets the ball, if I sit there and think about that fumble over and over and over again, I'll never have a good game the rest of that game. That game is done for me. If I sit and worry and think about my mistake instead of, okay, it happened. Let me make up for it. Let me just play harder. Let me be better. If I don't focus on the future, if I stay stuck with what I messed up with, I'll never progress on. I'll never actually continue to play. Because if I can't mentally get over that situation, then there's no need for me to be out there on the team. Any good runner knows that turning around and looking back in a race causes you to stumble. It does. It slows you down. The time it takes for you to turn your head, to look back, to see where you've been, what's behind you, that's going to slow you down and may even cause you to stumble and fall. Paul's not telling us to lose our memory to get amnesia about the things in the past. No, God can forgive and forget. We have a hard time with it. See, God chooses to forget. He doesn't have a memory problem. He chooses to forget our sin. It's us, you, me, that plays those same records over and over and over in our mind. See, what's behind us is done and settled. You can't do anything about that. The phrase forgive and forget is not in the Bible. People always say that and they quote it as if it's gospel. Forgive and forget. That's not in the Bible. Forgiveness is something God does because he chooses to forgive a repentant heart. Now we, we need to choose to forgive others. Now forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. Let me make sure we're clear on this. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. It's not like your brain just fell out your head and, oh, what happened? No. Forgiveness does not send a message to somebody that what you did is okay either. Just because you forgive somebody, again, that doesn't tell them, okay, what you did is, is, is fine. You can keep doing it. No, 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 no. God has us forgive so we can move on. It's not about the guilty party, the party that did us wrong. Forgiveness is for us so we can move on. Now, I'm talking about forgiving other people, but I'm also talking about forgiving yourself because some of us have a hard time forgiving ourselves. We live on those tapes of sinful things that we've done, repeated over and over, and we just stay there. We keep pushing play on those tapes over and over again. Paul says, forget what is behind you. Let me give you some quotes from some great men. Robert Quillian said, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. That's a happy marriage. The union of two good forgivers. Lewis Smead said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. When we forgive, it sets the prisoner free. Who's the prisoner? You, me, we're the prisoner because we're stuck, we're trapped in that bitterness, that hatred because we're having a hard time with somebody 
And you know what? That person is not even thinking about us. They done moved on with life, doing what they're doing, and we're the ones stuck back thinking about those people. We are trapped in that time, and they done moved on happily ever after. Another quote, Maurice Hooks said, Forgiveness sets you free, not the other person. Forgiveness will set you free. This is why we need to forgive. Some people that don't forgive are trapped in that time frame, in that era, in that phase of whatever happened. Forgiveness is something that sets you free. Now, forgiveness is not justice. That's a whole different thing. It's not being bound under someone any longer. See, that's what forgiveness is saying. Listen, I'm not trapped by you anymore. I am set free because I forgive you. Paul's advice is this. Forget what's behind and strain toward what's ahead. In other words, don't look back. You know, I was uh, having a prayer walk with one of the brothers, Scott, who did our communion today. And uh, we, he was just talking about, hey, did you watch the football games? And I, I said, you know what? I don't even watch football. Honestly, I watched the Super Bowl or maybe one or two games, but it's been 10, 15 years since I've ever sat down and watched a complete football game. And he couldn't understand it at first, like, well, why? I mean, you used to play. Isn't that something you love? And the fact of the matter is, yeah, I do love it, but I don't want to sit there and watch something that I know once I'm done is going to stay in my mind. It's going to make me think about it over and over. It's going to make me look back and think, why didn't I take that contract making the money that I could have made? Why did I? I mean, there's so many things that I would struggle with by just simply watching a complete game. Now, I watch the highlights or something, but I don't sit and just watch a complete game because it, it, it's, it's too challenging for me to do that. I'm not saying watching football is a sin. No, people can do that. But for me, I know myself. I know my challenges. I live in reality where that's just not what's best for me. But Paul says, forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. You say, well, preacher Mo, I don't know how to do that yet. How do I do that? Here's what you should do. Number one, talk about it. You talk about it with God and with somebody else. Call up a brother, uh, call up a sister. Sister, do what you gotta do. Talk about it with somebody. Pray about it, have a bonding time with that person. What else you do? Well, I'll encourage you to write a letter expressing your heart and your feelings. You don't have to give it to that person. You can throw it away. You can burn it. You can just shred it. You can do whatever. But get it out. And then thirdly, whoever you talk to about it, tell them, hey, ask me about it later on sometime. Check up on me. See how I'm doing. See, we've got to invite people into our lives. We can't just expect and assume everybody's just going to come on in. No, people don't get into each other's lives unless they feel invited into each other's eyes. We got to understand some of us, we just got a look on our face that tells people, whoa, you better back up a little bit. Not that you're mad, not that you're angry, but some of us just kind of look intense all the time. Well, that's not inviting. We need to make sure we are even verbally saying I want you in my life. I want you to help me. There's a story of a preacher who was talking to a seven-year-old daughter about the function of the body. And it said, what's the nose for? She said, smell. Well, what are your ears for? They're to hear. Well, what's your stomach for? She said, for food. He said, well, what is your heart for? And she quickly said, for loving God. See, that is what our heart is all about. It's about loving God. God. There's nothing more worthwhile than to do God's will and to finish it. Because each of us wants us to want to hear what Matthew 25, 21 says. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Third and final point here is this. We need to focus our attention on Jesus. We need to focus our attention on Jesus. You see, it's not about the bumps in the road. It's not about the distance. It's not about all the, the opposition from sinful men or temptations that are out there. Jesus faced all those things, but he did not quit. That's why the Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the best example 
of this spiritual marathon that we need to have. Every temptation that we face, he has gone through. He is the best example. Not because the job was easy. No, it was not easy for him to be flogged and crucified on the cross. Not easy at all. But yet, he faced opposition from sinful man and evil things happened, but yet he persevered. Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 3. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Again, verse 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame. The joy set before him endured the cross and scorning its shame. You know, most, most version says despising its shame. The New Living Translation says disregarding its shame. In other words, he ignored the shame of the cross. He didn't want it to bother him. He was so determined to do God's will and get it done that he was able to ignore what happened to him on the cross. Not that he didn't feel it, not that he didn't experience it, but yet that shame did not affect him from fulfilling God's will. He came and he endured the cross. Verse two again, it says, Jesus, the joy set before him. You think, now what joy did he experience while he was on the cross? Well, he was physically on the cross, but his eyes, his mind, his heart was somewhere else. It wasn't there. His joy was waiting for him in heaven. His joy was, I'm going to be with my father. I'm going to get through this. And no matter how it feels, my joy is the completion of this because I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with my father in heaven. This is what allowed him to finish the race so strong. He was focused. His joy was there because he knew he could be with God in heaven. You say, well, that's Jesus. Well, you know what, Stephen? Same thing. Stephen was being stoned. Acts 7, verse 55. It says, he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Here's a man who was being stoned. He looked up and he saw the right hand of God was there. Jesus right there, the right hand of God. That gave him so much joy to know he's going there. He's going home. He was able to be stoned without cursing at people and reacting in all these kind of ways. He understood this is what it takes to finish strong, having the focus of the finish, being with God in heaven. Again, we got to get focused back on Jesus. It's not about our, our the feelings and our desires. It's about finishing for God's will. John 21, verse 15 and 16. John 21, 15 and 16. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. I've read this and I thought, you know what? No wonder Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Before saying, feed my sheep. Why? Because the issue was Peter's heart for God. It wasn't about doing my task of feeding my sheep. The issue is, if you love me and if your heart is with me, then I know you will take care of my sheep the way you should. But if your focus is doing the sheep and then I'm doing this because... No, 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 you got it mixed up. Our first priority should be loving God and then taking care of the work that God asked for us to do. See, God wants to make sure you have the right heart about what you're doing before you do it. See, many of us can be doing church work without having a close relationship with God. That's sad, but that's where a lot of people are. They are so involved in the task of church 
that they lose the connection with Jesus. Our relationship with Jesus is greater than our work for Jesus. Now, I know for some people that's just going to like, whoa, I don't know. I ain't never heard that before. It's a fact. Your relationship with Jesus is more important than your work for Jesus. We need to take care of that relationship with Jesus first. That's why he said, Peter, it's about me and you, our love first before the people. And if you love me the way you should, then I trust you're going to take care of the people. See, our main focus is not working for God, but in being with God. If you're focused on working for God, you're run out of energy soon. You're not going to be able to finish the race. Jesus didn't die so you can be exhausted, so you can be emotionally drained. That's not why he died. He died so you could be set free and have life to the full. That's why he died for you. This is how we finish strong in 2021. Number one, be prepared for the struggles to come. We don't know what those struggles are going to be. But if I'm close to God, if I'm tied in with Jesus, if I'm tied in with the fellowship, then I'm going to be able to get through whatever the challenge may be. Secondly, we got to forget what's behind. We can't let what happened in January, February, March, all that stuff cannot hold us back. It cannot keep us trapped back there. We got to forget what is behind and we got to press on towards the goal. And then thirdly, our focus of our attention needs to be on Jesus. Why? Because if we're focused on Jesus, we're able to get through whatever it is because that is our goal. That is what some people say our happy place. Go to your happy place. Go to Jesus. Think about heaven. Think about seeing God in heaven. Think about sitting down with Jesus and asking him every question you want to ask. That needs to be our happy place. I love you. I pray that this is something that encouraged you, challenged you, and inspired you. But I want us to continue to focus on finishing strong. We're going to talk about finishing strong the rest of this year. Emotionally, in our parenting, in our marriages, in our own just self-discipline, every area we could think of, we're going to focus on finishing strong. I love you. Thank you for joining us. And to God be the glory. Hello, family. My name is Milan, and this is my wife, Christina, and we're the Youngs. Just wanted to take a minute to thank my wife for today's message, and um, just pray that we can all receive it and apply it to our day-to-day -day lives. Before I close this out in prayer, my wife is going to give this week's announcements. There's Men's Midweek on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. Next Sunday, service will be here on YouTube again at 10 a.m., but please keep praying that God will open doors so that we can meet in person this month. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for allowing us this time together today. Thank you for allowing us to receive your message through Maurice. Uh, please be with us. Um, be with our sister churches in Haiti as they are going through a multitude of issues. Be with all the students and teachers that are returning and um, protect the environments that we're in like only you can. In your son's name we pray. Amen.